little shadow that could ever come against your life. There is no rival that could ever stand against your mind. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, you've already won, yeah. There is no weapon that has ever left a mark on you. There is no army with the power to conquer true. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, you've already won. Let's go! There is a kingdom that's advancing at the speed of light. And in his kingdom, in his kingdom every dead thing is bound to rise. Shake off despair as I sing out your name A victory dance, I will dance out in faith I will crush disappointment and break every chain Come on! Now all of my fear has will turn into faith of despair. Shake off despair as I sing out your great name A victory gonna dance, dance out, gonna dance out in praise I will crush disappointment and break every chain now
shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in vain. I will crush disappointment and break every chain. Come on, now all of my fear I will turn into praise. Shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in vain. I will crush disappointment and break every chain. Last time. This morning, shake somebody's hand right now. Would you do that? Find a guest nearby you and shake their hand. Greet them in the name of the Lord. What a great day and what a privilege to have everybody here. Pastor Ryan had some special friends that's driven in from out of town and of course our guest speakers, but Sherry's family, Pastor Braniff and his family are here today from De Quincey. Let's welcome them. My wife's sister, Jana. Amen. Jeremy, my son and his family, Charity, my little charity girl, sweet. I'm going to pause a minute and just reflect on how nice it is to have Charity here. It's, it's not that I don't get excited that Jeremy's here, but I just have one girl, Jeremy. I'm sorry. I, but I have Eva here, my granddaughter. So, but... Uh, Chris and Sarah Jett came in all the way from Illinois and their family. How cool. Thank you. And uh, Pastor Derek and Leisha Parker are here from New Orleans somewhere. Yes. And who else? Wait a minute. I'm forgetting. I should have written names down. That's That's why I hate to do this. I forget people. Who else? 
Nobody? But we're glad everybody's here. Especially glad to have Pastor Mark McCool. What would you say? You're a, a, a tweener? He's a tweener. If you wasn't hearing first word, you don't know what that means. That means we're in between generations. No, I think I'm in that upper generation he's talking about. Uh, he said, I'm not being put out to pasture. I like the pasture. <laughs> our, our RV's sitting right out in the middle of a pasture, man. It, almost, it, yeah. But, and then Brother Ryan will introduce his special guest today that came. But if you missed first word, you got to go back and listen on our sites to this marvelous message we heard today from pa Pastor Mark McCool. So, they gave me a, a little time to say something today, but I'm not going to say a lot. I just, uh, today is installation day for Pastor Ryan and Sister Sherry. So, even though this has already been done, this... <laughs> This is a day that we're going to take a little time, especially at the end of the service, and we're going to pray over this couple. Look what the Lord has done. How about let's just give him some uproarious praise for what God has done. Yes. And as Brother McCool preached in first word, a double portion is on its way. That means double responsibility. We embrace it. We accept it. And my wife and I are just happy to be a part. And I promise you, we're going to be the biggest fans of POBC and just our kids and all of you. Thank you, Brother McCool, for acknowledging the wonderful saints of the Pentecostals of Bossier because we're not here without you. We're not here. Give yourself a great hand, all right? At the end of the service today, we're going to take some time to pray for anybody that needs prayer. And nothing would make us any happier than to baptize somebody today in the name of Jesus. Or to see someone receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Nothing. That trumps everything we're doing here. But we're going to take some time to pray as a church body. And I'm going to have these elders praying over Pastor Ryan and Sister Sherry. And because they need our prayers. And I know you're praying for them. They need our prayers. You prayed for me all these years. And you just keep praying. God's going to do some spectacular things. I'm looking at this building this morning. We did not enjoy having two services during COVID. At the end of that deal, we actually did not like it. We, we just began to just don't like it at all. We just got sick of it. And anyway, we made it, didn't we? But look what the, look what's happening here. We, amen. All right. Praise God. What's next? I'm getting out of the way. The team's coming back to sing. Oh, yeah, we got us. We have a very special treat this morning. Let's go. Let the lion roar. Hail, hail, lion of Judah. 
Oh, come on, why don't we take that praise to Jesus right now? Come on, POBC. Wow. POBC, I know you know this, but we are very, very blessed. Today is a special day. Today is a very, very special day, and the Dean family is a very talented and anointed group of people, man, and we're so excited about what this day means for this church. Amen? And uh, I'm trying to hold back tears. I got the spirit of my pastor on me. Um, that was incredible. Thank you, River and Raylan, for showing us your talents today. Why don't we give a hand clap to them? Raylan's up here playing the piano with no in-ears, nothing. I mean, that is absolutely in t talent, and so we're excited about today. Today is a very special day. Today is our installation service of our pastor, Pastor Ryan and Sister Sherry, and the whole Dean family, Georgia, River, and Raylan, and we are so excited about what this day means for this church. Amen? I got a couple miles. Y'all can have a seat. Y'all can have a seat. I wish announcements seem a little irrelevant right now. I wish we could just go right back into worship, but I just got one quick announcement. Um, uh, tomorrow is kids camp. Do we have any kids going to kids camp? Wow, that was, uh, let me hear your voices, kids. Are you going to kids camp? Okay, there we go. Yeah, we got a bunch of kids going to kids camp. So uh, parents, listen to me just briefly. They're loading the van at 8.30 and they're leaving at 9 and they will serve canes for lunch in the dorms. They will not be stopping in Natchitoches, but they will be serving lunch in the dorms. Um, also, please, 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 no peanut products, obviously, because we have some students that might be allergic to peanut products. So no peanut products in your snacks. Don't pack that in the dorms. Um, and we're excited about what Kids Camp is going to take place this week. We always have kids that get the Holy Ghost, and it's a life-changing experience. So parents and people that are not going to Kids Camp, would you do something? Would you pray for these kids that are going this week to Kids Camp? Because there are going to be some that receive the Holy Ghost, and some are going to commit themselves to Jesus. And there, this is a very life-changing time as we enter into camp season. Amen? Also, after service, they are serving uh, barbecue Sundays, so that's like a handheld uh, item where you can eat. There no, there's no sit-down. It's not like a sit-down dinner. There are some seats for the elders, um, but it's barbecue Sundays right after service, and I believe they're serving them across the street to help continue on the celebration. It's a time for you to say hello to our pastors and to greet them and to talk to them as well. Amen? Y'all ready to get back to worship? I know I am too. Elshers, if you would come to the front, we're going to take up the offering and continue on with this amazing and special day. Father, thank you so much for what this day means to the Pentecostal of Bozier City, God. As we have already seen in the season that we are in in revival, God, we know this is an ordained day, God. And I pray a special blessing from this day forward, God, that you touch this congregation and our pastors, God. In Jesus' name, God, as we give today, God, I ask that we give with gladness. And everybody said, in Jesus' name, amen. be discouraged even when I'm discouraged I'll remind my soul of all you've done before I won't be distracted even in the distraction I will trust the one who's greater than the storm I will trust the one Who's greater than the storm? I don't need another reason. I don't need more convincing. The same God who made a way is the same God who's here today. Even in my darkest moment, this 
Clap of praise going for a moment. Somebody's reaching out to God right now. And we're not in too big of a hurry to let God speak to somebody in this moment. Somebody pray right now. Lift up your voice. Lift up your heart. The presence of God already began ministering to somebody. Let the presence of God minister to you right now. Would you lift up your hands to heaven and reach out for a moment? Reach out with your spirit. Reach out with your praise. Let the anointing of the Holy Ghost have its perfect stamp placed upon this service. Somebody reach out right now.
you're wondering what we're doing right now, let me explain. This might be Installation Sunday, but the reason that we are here today is because of what is happening in these altars. This is his first service at the Pentecostals of Osher. Josh has been teaching him Bible studies. He's been talking to him. He's feeling the presence of God right now, and this is his response. That's why we're not progressing just yet. The presence of God is moving in this house. Don't let the moment pass you by. If you need something from God right now, the waters are clearly stirred for you. Reach out and cry out. Reach out and cry out. Let the Holy Ghost move your heart right now. There's a distinct spirit of freedom in the house today. Look, I know they already told you, they already told you at the end of service that y'all are gonna pray over us. You're not just praying over us. You're praying over you too. You're praying over this church. You are praying that the authority of the Word of God would reign supreme in this place. And in doing so, we grant the liberty of the Holy Ghost to move whenever He wants. So this isn't bothering anybody. It's, it's my task to introduce our speaker here today. But wouldn't it be nice if God was put His stamp of approval on everything for somebody to be baptized in that precious name. To be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Speaking in a brand new language as the Spirit gives the utterance. They asked several, I guess it's several months ago now, we were in staff meeting and the staff asked, well, who would you like to have speak at the installation service? And if you don't, if you don't know me well enough, you don't know, I am completely uncomfortable even discussing any of it. I'm not, I'm not as big about attention although my son every time the cameras went on him he smiled real big I'm, I'm sure he's he's a lot better with the attention but I one one name came to mind when they asked and I said it's J.H. Osborne and for a lot of you if you've ever been to men's conference for any period of time you know that he comes around very often because he's a lot of people's favorite preacher now full disclosure and brother Osborne I have to be perfectly honest my number one preacher is, un, he's, you, you can't unseat him. Nobody can. That's Pastor Dean. That is my father. He is forever and always my number one favorite preacher. But I do have a Mount Rushmore. 
And right beside his face on that Mount Rushmore of great anointed preachers is Brother J.H. Osborne. We asked him, and I, I told the staff, I said, look, we're late, we're late in planning this. That's the original date was right during the middle of men's conference season. He's booked up solid. I said, but I'm gonna call just in case. And I called him and he said, Ryan, I'm so sorry, I am booked for that date. He said, but you have a few moments. And I said, yes, sir. And I was sitting at a dry cleaner right in front of Barksdale Air Force Base. And I was watching planes come in and go out. And for the next 20 minutes, he preached the most amazing sermon just for me on that phone. And I said, Brother Osborne, I'm gonna have to see if we can reschedule this weekend because we have to have this great man, this incredible preacher, he does us a great honor to be here with us this weekend. Would you make it a great applause for God allowing for Brother Osborne to come and be with us this Sunday. We welcome you to this pulpit with perfect liberty. Come and deliver the word for us. Keep that going for a moment. God deserves it right now. Wish I could remember what I told him over the phone. It saved me a lot of trouble and <laughs> tried to remember. You can be seated for a moment if you would, please. Thank you for inviting me. I can tell by how I'm feeling I miss Sister Osborne's missing me. This will be directed to Pastor Ryan and Sister Sherry Dean. Uh, thank you so much for the comfortable room you've given me and uh, the beautiful, wonderful, delicious food we had last night. Man, that was, that was great. I've, had, I've eaten a lot of uh, food <laughs> at church events and it's not always you know, top notch. It's <laughs> some people can cook and some people can't, but it's the people that can't that want to, you know, and uh, so it works a hardship, but the room, the hospitality, all the food. Thank you for the invitation, brother. Uh, Ryan's a little beside himself right now, and you can understand that. He's, he's kind of delirious. And, uh, He's been very kind to me and how much we've enjoyed. Bishop and Sister Dean have just been a treasured friendship of Sister Osborne and I for a long time. We live a thousand dollars apart. It's what it costs to come see each other. <laughs> so, but I have valued him and his ministry and his dedication to the kingdom of God. And I always felt safe knowing he was around. You know, it's just a beautiful thing when you have friendships and acquaintances like that. Brother Pastor Mark and Sister Jamie McCool, for years, I can't imagine them not being in our lives. They've just, uh, they've just uh, been a treasure again to us. What a great, beautiful job he did today concerning the whirlwinds and the hurricanes and what comes along after him. Thank you for being here today, for lending yourself to the Lord. Some people say, well, I don't know what I'm going to do, what I'm going to say. It's not about doing or saying, it's just about being there. You know, you just be there and that's, you offer yourself. It's like the presence of the Lord. In the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy. He doesn't have to do a trick for you. He doesn't have to do a miracle. He just has to be there. Because in his presence, he gives you all the joy you can possibly get just being there, you know. He doesn't have to say anything, doesn't have to do anything, doesn't have to function in any way. He just being there. Get your joy as full as you can, as you can get it. I'll try to be considerable of your time today. I don't want you to waste your time. Time is a valuable thing because you can't get it back. Waste your money, you might make it back, you know, but waste your time, you don't have any way of getting that back. A couple took their baby to an opera and uh, he tried to get in and they couldn't let him in. They said, no, you can't take babies in there because they cry and it disrupts the whole thing. People paid a lot of money. They said, this baby don't cry. And uh, they said, well, no, we, you can't take babies in there. And the man reassured them they had bought the tickets and did everything they knew to do to get in there. And they assured them the baby wouldn't cry. So 
They watched the first act, and the, boy, the man asked his wife, said, what did you think about that? And she said, well, I didn't care for it, really. He said, well, I didn't either. So pinch the baby. So, you know, I've been in some places where I've known babies were pinched and uh, try to get up and be able to get out. Thank you both for the privilege of, of, of speaking to you on behalf of this installation service. I, I, I passed here for 45 years. That's not a record, it's just a fact. And uh, I have a lot of messages. I have all my messages cataloged and uh, dated. And uh, in, my, in my office, my wife says, I can't have any more. So I guess it's over. I tried to find a message that covered all the nuances and, and moving parts of being a pastor, and I just couldn't find one that, would, that was suitable, that would work in something like that, you know. So I'll read a verse of scripture for you. And out of the book of 2 Samuel, the seventh chapter, the 20th verse, in verse 21. 2 Samuel 7, 20 and 21. It says, and what can David say more to thee? David has run out of words. I don't know what to say more to you. I don't know how to put another sentence together to you, God. For thou, Lord God, knowest thy servant. You know me. It's great to have God to know you, to really know who you are, and you don't have to say anything to him. He knows you. He knows your heart. He knows what you like and what you love. In the 21st verse, he said, For thy word's sake, and according to my own heart, hast thou done all these great things, to make thy servant know them. Everything he said that you have done, God, has flowed from your heart. Everything you have said of the great things that you have done, everything that you have performed in my life and in the world, every miracle, every sign, every wonder, he said it flowed from your heart. And I'd like for your, make your servant to know them. If you could just make me understand them and make me to comprehend everything that you have said and everything that you have done, I, I would just like for you to make me to know them. If you could take this book and you could just know this book, it would be enough to get you through life. If you could just know something of all the great things that he had done. Because this book flows from the heart of God. If you can understand, if you understand this book, you understand the heart of God. Because it flows from his heart. And he's, David said, I don't have anything else to say. I've run out of words. But he said, if you could just make me to know all the great things and wonderful things that you've done for me, you know. And when you look, you know, you want to, Moses said, show me your glory, God. I want to see your glory. And he said, well, I can't show you my glory. Nobody's seen my face and lived. He said, well, what, do you have a second choice? He said, well, there is a place up here by me, uh, up on a mountain. And he said, if you'd like to come up here, why? Uh, he, so, so Moses went up there. And then he put, his, he put him back in a cave, then put his hand over the cave. He's got pretty big hands, you know. He measured out the waters, the oceans out of the palm of his hand. So he's got pretty big hands. And he said, no man can pluck you out of my hands. And there are quite a few people. So he's got pretty big hands. So he put him in a cave, a mountain cave. Then he put his hand over it and put him in the dark. Because when God gets ready to show you something, he first of all puts you in the dark. So when he moves his hand, you will appreciate what you're seeing. So he says, you can't see my face but I will show you my hinder parts. I'm going to pass by you. And I won't let you see where I'm going. I won't let you see my face where I am. But I will let you see where I've been. So if you want to see the glory of God, look where he's been in your life. Like you should have already been dead by now. Most of you should have already died of diseases or something, you know. Many of you would have already died. So when you look behind you, it's like the wake of a boat. You can't see the boat, but you can see the wake it made when it through. It's like the bride comes down the aisle. You're looking at her veil, the train that comes behind you. God said, I won't let you see where I'm going, but I will let you see where I've been because that's where my glory is at in your life. So when you look behind you and you see what God has done for you and how good God has been to you, how God got you up when you couldn't get up by yourself, when God lifted you when you couldn't lift yourself, when God saved you when you couldn't save yourself, God healed you and you couldn't heal yourself. When you look behind you, he said, that's where my glory's at. I'll let you see the train. And he's got a pretty big train, you know. 
because he saw him high and lifted up Isaiah did. And his train filled all the temple, <laughs> went everywhere, all in and out the stairs and up and down, because he's got a lot he's done in our lives, a lot he has done in all of our lives. Thank you again for allowing me to be here. I'm going to talk to Ryan and Sherry on things you should know. He said concerning his word that flowed from his heart, he said, make thy servant to know them. Let me be clear about this service today and what we're not doing. You know, Brother Mark, bless his heart, he, he, he don't leave much meat on the bone. You know, he sucks the marrow out of the bone. When you pick it up, you just look at it. It's just bleached out like dry bones that have been in the desert. You know, there's just nothing left. I mean, you can suck on it, but you ain't getting no flavor out of it or anything. It's just just nothing left but I'm going to try because maybe he missed something maybe he overlooked something and that's what it would have to be so let me be clear about this service today and what we're not doing we're not installing one couple over another we're installing one generation over another generation in my opinion the Bible said David served his generation and by the will of God then he fell asleep in some manner each of us are held accountable to serve our own generation. In my opinion, God calls someone out of the same generation they are called to serve. If God's looking for somebody to serve a generation, he calls someone out of that generation to serve that generation. He doesn't call somebody out of a past generation or a future generation to serve a present generation, but he chooses someone out of the generation they have been called to serve. If you're not a part of that generation, it's hard for you to serve that generation. If you're not a part of them, like me, it's hard for me to serve this generation. I don't understand them. I try, you know, I try my best. I just can't fathom it, you know, I can't, I'm not talking about the whole, I'm talking about this apostolic generation, I'm talking about the whole generation, you know. I don't understand putting steel in your face and, and putting enough rings in your eyebrows to hang a pair of shower curtains on. I don't, I don't understand it. You know, I, I can't grapple with it. I don't, I just, I look at it and I just wonder, you know, and, and, and for me to serve that generation, it, it's, it's difficult for me to think about, I can prognos prognosticate where they're going to go. If they don't straighten up, you know, and I can be critical of the generation because I'm not a part of it, you know. And uh, you tend to, if you're not a part of a generation, it's hard to serve that generation. It's difficult to serve a generation you're not a part of because you tend to criticize them and complain and judge and condemn and censure and find fault and disapprove of the new generation. You know, when, when they came out of the Babylonian captivity, you know, for, for all those years and the, the, another generation started rebuilding the, the foundation of Solomon's, of the temple, you know, the people started shouting and dancing and playing tambourines and blowing trumpets, having a great time, except the old folks, they began crying. You know, there were a bunch of ball bags looking at it. It don't look like it used to, you know, and it's a, you know, they, they weren't happy to have the, the, the foundation back. They were looking at how it used to look, you know, and they were crying and bawling and carrying on. So there were two generations were not responding the same way to rebuilding the temple again. They wanted it built like it had been built in the past. So you don't want to get, let your past get behind you because if your past ever gets behind you, you are doomed. If your future ever gets behind you, you are doomed. Israel always let their future get behind them. They could never look forward to the lows. They could never look forward to what they were going to get in, in the promised land. They're always looking back. I remember the flesh pots. I remember the, the, the cucumbers. And I remember the melons. It was always what they remembered was behind them. Because the future, the further away you get from your future, the further away you get from your past, the better it looks. They're like some people. You know, when you look at your past and the further you get from it, the better it looks. They talk about the old days, how wonderful and glorious they are. That's though you're looking through a prism of your own making, you know. It wasn't all that great. The past wasn't. But the further you get from it, the better it looks. 
And when Israel got further away from their past, they forgot about having to give your sons the crocodiles and having to, you know, build treasure cities for Pharaoh and walk slime pits and, and, and live in huts and what have you. They forgot all that, and they just remembered, you know, all the meat and all the good things that was back there supposedly for the good old days. Because <laughs> the further you get from it, the better it looks. But your future tends to get behind you when you're always looking back at how good things were in the past. But God has got something amazing has already been said for this church and how great God's going to operate and function. You know, you, these are things that you should know that you don't want your future to ever get behind you. When I was just a kid, back when the world was young, I'd go to my grandparents' farm in Kentucky. I'd spend my summers there. And they lived, my grandparents lived at the end of the world. I thought it was the end of the world. You know, I really did. I mean, I didn't, I thought it was as far as you could go. We'd never been anyplace else. So for Pete's sake, whoever Pete is, I thought that that was the end of the world. You know, that was as far as you could go because the road run out. There's no place else to go. You know, it was just the end. And of course, you had an asphalt road for a while. Then it turned into a, a gravel road. And the gravel road turned into a dirt road. And the dirt road turned into two ruts with grass down the middle. That was to my grandmother's house. You turned and went in front of her house. There was no more road. That was it. That was, it was all over with. That was as far as you could go. I thought Kentucky was the first place, the only place you could go. My wife and I went to Florida after we got married, back when the world was a little bit older. And we saw a tire, you know, one of them, one of them semis, a tire came off. We thought it was alligator. We finally seen an alligator. No, it was a semi-tar that blowed apart. You know, we didn't know what one looked like. We never had seen anything or been anywhere, you know. We were as ignorant as two kids out there. But went to Kentucky, and I'd go down and spend my, my, my days, my, my summers down there with my grandfather. And he worked me like a borrowed mule, you know. It wasn't like no fun or anything. It's just, uh, he just, you know, they worked all the time and always something to do. And he had about 300 acres, and, and you qualified it by the land that was tillable, how much of the farm could be farmed and make a crop in the very little of it ever could make a crop, you know, not very much of it was tillable and he, it couldn't be plowed or planted or harvested. You owned it, but there would be no profit from it. There was one beautiful level field of about five acres that was absolutely covered with rocks. And my grandfather thought it was his job and my job to collect the rocks and get them out of that field. So we, 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 it, like, it was like heaven had salted that field with these huge rocks. I, it was just rock. They were all about the same size, about like a soccer ball, and uh, all at the same time. I think they were geos. They had knobs, looked like a brain, and, um, and they, were, they were everywhere. Just the bland was covered. So he'd hook a mule up to an old flatbed trailer. We'd get out in that field and just pick up rocks and lay them on that, tra on that old flatbed and a wagon, and then we'd take them over to the corner of a field and have to haul them and take them over to the corner of the field and unload that, all that rock. Then we'd go back and, and pick, rock, pick up rocks all day long. It's so all we did is pick up rocks. Those was boring, backbreaking, nonsensical jobs that you could have. And we just picked up rocks all day. My, my grandfather was old. He was probably 40. And uh, I was a kid, so I thought he was like, you know, he didn't have a tooth in his head, but he could eat an apple. He could probably bust a walnut with his gums. He was so tough. <laughs> and uh, we, we, we picked up rocks all day in this, in this field of about five acres. And uh, uh, it was backbreaking work. It was, a, it was an unending task because when we thought we'd got most of the rocks, then it would rain. And the rain would just wash the dirt off and there's more rocks. You know, it's like we hadn't done anything. Back out there, hook the mule up, get the old flatbed, went and pick up rocks, pick up rocks, pick up rocks. All we ever did was ever pick up rocks out of that field. Now, I do believe my, 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 my grandfather, you know, uh, I don't think he knew he'd ever get all the rocks out of that field. It was an unending job. But for some reason, he kept on picking up rocks. It didn't take a lot of discipline or didn't take a lot of a, you didn't have to have a good education, to pick up rocks. It's a pretty well a mundane task, you know. It wasn't like you had to be a genius or something. You didn't need a, didn't need a calculator or anything. It was just picking up rocks out of the field, all about the same size. I don't believe he, he, he might have toiled in hope, but he never talked to me about it, you know, that someday this would all be over. But I just thought it would be like forever. It's like, you know, this will be our job to, for eternity, you know. It wasn't much inspiration to a kid, but that's what we did anyway. And he died, and we buried him across the road. Not very, you could throw a rock and hit his grave, and we had plenty to throw. So, uh, 
you never see any fruit from his labors. About 25 years ago, I went back down there to a family reunion, the Osborne family reunion. It's my gene pool. It needs a little bleach in it, but it was my gene pool nevertheless, all the Osbournes. I'll show you a picture of them to let you know how. You know, you ever see a picture taken, you know, back in the old days, nobody smiles? They look like you owed them money or something. I don't even know you. You know, you're looking at me like they got that gr grim look on their face, like they ought to be hanging in a post office or something. It just look, even the women look mean, you know, and they got a stern look on their face like, I don't know. I don't know. My wife said, do you want me to hang it up in your office? I said, I don't want to look at that. I'm not hanging up my office. Why would I want to look at that all the rest? That's my gene pool. That's where I came from. That's the Osbournes. No wonder I, I, I have problems and I have <laughs> mental scatteredness now and then. You know, it's, look where I came from. About 25 years ago, I went back down to a family reunion, all my cousins and, you know, I went back and I said, let's go over just across the road and see the old home place. Let's, that's what they call it, the old home place. Anybody have any idea what I'm talking about? The old home place, you know? Well, you didn't live, they live in, kids, they don't have a home place because there'd be one over here and one over there and one over here and one up there. And it'd take you the rest of your life to visit your home places. We went back and uh, we a little road with, with the two ruts and the grass down the middle. And, and wound around, got, went back down there. And we got there. I was so surprised because they'd built a new home there. It was a beautiful new home. They had a swimming pool. My grandfather would have turned over in his rock bed if he had seen that place over there. <laughs> a, a, a swimming pool. The barn was gone. The, 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 the smokehouse was gone. The wash house was gone. Everything valuable was gone, you know? And they'd built this big, beautiful home there. And uh, they had bulldozed and reconstructed the landscape. And I began to look. I couldn't figure out where anything was. I was walking around saying, well, where'd the barn used to be, you know? And where, where was this at? Where was that? We couldn't figure out where anything was. It was all, it, this man had wrecked all my memories. He had taken everything valuable out of my life, you know, and uh, by reconstructing the old home place. So I said, let's get out of here. There's nothing here. There's no memories here, you know. So we got in the car. We're driving back down the road. I said, well, stop the car just a minute. They stopped, and I got out. It was right beside that field. And I looked, and there was corn growing there higher than my head. I said, would you look at that? That man's going to eat corn where I picked up rocks. And I ain't going to, he ain't calling me. Man, I love corn on the cob. I don't know. I put butter on it, salt on it. Man, I'm like a typewriter. I just run it through my mouth, you know. One of them electrics, I can eat some corn on the cob, you know. And I said, here's a man that's eating corn on my back. He's eating corn. I should have took a stalk of it over across the road and laid it on my grandfather's grave. And here's what you work for all your life. This guy over here is living in a new home, eating corn, where we picked up rocks and never got one thing out of it. This is something you should know. One picks up rocks so that someone else can eat corn. And the rock gatherer doesn't always get to eat the corn. But you've got to have faith in God that somebody will eat some corn based on your labor and your toil and your sacrifice and your giving and your back broken and your skinned up knuckles and you got nothing from it. But there's a generation going to eat corn from one generation's labor and toil. I know that Bishop and Sister Dean also know that you've picked up many rocks from unprofitable fields. Matthew informed us saying the world is the field and you have labored and toiled tirelessly. Sometimes the little hope of giving a harvest for the many rocks strewn fields. You've gone to bed with sore backs and calloused hands wondering if the struggle was worth it. You poured your lives and your tears into others paid their bills, saved their marriages, gave them hope only to find their return was a pile of rocks in the corner of a worthless field. They'd be assured today, Bishop and Sister Dean, 
There are children today who are eating corn due to your time spent picking up rocks from their broken homes and dysfunctional families. Just so you know it, Brother and Sister Dean, just so you know, your labor has not been in toil. Your back was sore. You wondered. It seemed hopeless. But today, unknowing to you, there are children that have parents. There are families that are back together. There are husbands still loving their wives. You don't know anything about it, but you picked up rocks out of their field when you were tired and weary and wondered about it. But God lets one generation eat corn if there's a generation that'll pick up rocks. But today is a day of transition and another team will hitch their lives to the wagon and head to the rocky fields of this world. It's something, Pastor Ryan, and your precious wife need to know. Don't ever forget that you will enjoy and reap harvest because of the labors of others who have preceded you. You have simply entered into the labors of others. So always honor your heritage and those who went before you. Know this, you will pick up rocks so the generation coming after you can eat corn. That's just something that you should know. Here is something you should know that will get you beyond the parking lot. I have a message I'm working on called Beyond the Parking Lot. I shouldn't have said that, but he doesn't. Most messages don't get beyond the parking lot, you know. They don't because ask them the next day what you preached. They don't know. But here's something that to get you beyond the parking lot. God said, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. With all the wealth of the world belongs to God. The odd thing about it is that he isn't carrying any of it with him. I always like to have a little cash. I'm just kind of like that, you know. I just, I know young people just carry credit cards, you know. There's, you know, I got like plastic, and that's plastic's good for me, you know. And I got plastic too. I got a library card and all kinds of stuff. I got a Sam's Club card and got a lot of stuff, you know. <clears throat> but I like to have a little cash, you know. I don't, I don't, may not even spend it, you know. I just feel better knowing if I needed to, I could, you know. You would think Jesus, being God manifest in the flesh, if he has all the silver and all the gold and he knows where it's at, he need to carry a little with him. I mean, just in case you needed something, you know. Like, you're going to feed 5,000, you ain't got no money, you know. (laughs) Why bring it up, you know, you ain't got no money if you just carry a little, you don't even carry a wallet, evidently, or a purse, or a pocket, you know. He got it all, but he don't, Bring it. So what good does it do you if you have it all, but you don't carry it ever with you? Like some of you, you've got more money than you could spend and can't afford to give an offering. I'm sounding like Mark McCool now. <laughs> you would think the Lord would just pick up a few nuggets along the way, just in case, you know. He sends Peter to catch a fish with a coin in it. For Pete's sake, you can't even pay your taxes. How old do you think the disciples are? I'm going to get a little shady territory here now. The temple tax was instituted in the Old Testament. It was a half a shekel. When you're 20 years and older, you had to pay a half a shekel. That was your temple tax. When they came to the disciples and said to Peter, why doesn't your master pay his taxes? Temple tax, not Herod's tax, but temple tax. It's a half a shekel. He said, go fishing, because he didn't have no money, you know. Go fishing, and he got a coin. And evidently, it was, the, I don't know what the coin was, but evidently it was, it was a, a shekel, worth a shekel, because he said, go pay the taxes for me and for thee. Okay, that's good. What about the other 11? They don't pay taxes? The only excuse I could find for not paying taxes is that they'd already paid them, but I can't believe that because they never had two nickels to rub together for anything, you know. Or they had to be less than 20 years old. <laughs> you say, I've seen pictures of them. They're older than that. You know. <laughs> I've seen the Lord's Supper, and they're older than that. You know. well, 
You know, you may be right. They maybe are older than that. But tell me, why didn't they have to pay their taxes? He just paid it for Peter, who was the oldest. He was married. And for Jesus, who was 30 and older. So why didn't he pay for the other 11? Well, in my humble opinion, that is every day debated. They were less than 20 years of age. Because at 20, you had to pay your temple tax. At 20 years old, they all died the wilderness because that was the age of of accountability. It's it's really quiet in here, and that's scary. But be that as it may, you know. (laughs) If you have a better idea, you can share that with me. I'd like a little scripture to go with it. But if you have an idea with it, why that would be nice, you know. (laughs) Because I do have a little scripture. I do have a little thought process about it, you know. If If the other 11 don't have to pay, then evidently they were less than, they were 19 years old or younger. If they're younger than that, why would two grown men have to bring their mother with them? to talk to Jesus about getting them to sit on either side of Jesus. You know? Why are you bring your mother with you, your grown men? Well, be that as a man, I'm getting off now. Just don't despise young people. Because when Jesus got to picking out men, he didn't pick no gray beards and stooped shoulders and wrinkled up faces. Cause you why? He's after another generation. That generation was a generation of vipers. I'm not after that generation. I need a generation out of the generation to win them. He doesn't carry any money, so he has to get a fish. You know, he doesn't have any money to feed the 5,000, so he's got to get a lad's lunch. So the question, if God wanted to make a purchase, what would he use to make the expenditure with? What medium of exchange? If God wanted to buy something, what coin would he use? You need to understand the economy of God. May I suggest to you that since the Lord does not carry silver or gold, he does carry people in his pocket and will spend one person to buy another person. He will spend you like pocket change. Because if God is spending, God is buying. He doesn't throw his money away. He doesn't throw people away. When you lay on your bed at night and you feel spent, just know God bought something. You just don't know what he bought. He doesn't tell you what he's going to do with his economy. He just says, I carry you and you and you and every child of God. I carry you in my pocket. And when I get ready to buy another man, I will spend you in order to buy them. So when you lay on your bed and feel spent, you understand God has bought something. You just don't know what he bought. You understand me, Pastor Ryan? Because you will lay on your bed and feel spent. Church will be over and you will be spent. And you'll look back at people and it's a yawn fest. (laughs) And you wonder if you accomplished anything. You'll wonder if anything is happening because of what you just preached. But don't judge it too critically. Because if you feel spent, God bought something. You just don't know what he bought. You just have no idea what he bought. And they cried with a loud voice. Concerning Stephen, stopped their ears, ran upon him with one accord, cast him out of the city, stoned him, and the witness laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon the Lord, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He kneeled down, cried with a loud voice, lay not this into their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. There is nothing to suggest in the Bible that I know of that Saul had Stephen had ever met. Saul was traveling the country, persecuting the churches. This may appear to be a random chance. The meeting of Saul would be there at Stephen's death. But I'm convinced that it was orchestrated by God. It's not an accident, but an intentional purpose. Because I'm sure the watching disciples were expecting God to deliver Stephen and kill Saul. That would be human reasoning. Stephen's full of faith and power and wonders and miracles. Saul's full of hatred, malice, persecution and killings. But God was getting ready to make a purchase. And this purchase was going to be expensive. He was not buying some ordinary man. He's buying a man that he understood could write the rest of the New Testament. 
He's getting ready to purchase a man that he knew had the epistles locked up in him. He had church order locked up in him. Nobody could see it, but God could see it. He knew he was going to be pricey. He could not buy him an ordinary man. So he let him watch a man full of the Holy Ghost, a man full of power in the presence of God. He watched that man die, and Saul was never the same from that moment on. But Stephen didn't know what God bought that day. He died in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts. He doesn't even know there's a ninth chapter of the book of Acts where Saul's on his way to Damascus, sees a great light that knocks him down. And he, and he said, why Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And Saul was never the same. He said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. I let you watch Stephen die. I spent Stephen to buy you, Saul. I spent a good man to buy a bad man. I spent a man full of the Holy Ghost to buy a man that persecuted the Holy Ghost. Because if I'm... And Stephen died not knowing why God let him be killed and let the killer of men live. But when God is spending, God is buying you just never know what he's buying. I want to see Stephen walk in the streets of gold and look up and meet Saul, wondering how on earth did you get here? The last time I saw you, you were grinning at my death. Last time I saw you, you had the clothes that the witnesses that were stoning me so they could wind up better, take their clothes and lay them down at your feet. I watched you destroy the church that I, all I wanted was to live for. How did you get here? And Saul would have to say to Stephen, I was never the same after I watched you die. Stephen, God bought me with you. You gave your life that I might live. And you never saw anything beyond that seventh chapter of Acts. When I got to write the epistles, I wrote church order. Because Saul had something in him Stephen didn't have in him. So he spent him to buy the man that could do the job he had in order. So you see somebody walk in the door. You've got no idea God might spend a Holy Ghost-filled person to buy a person that looks like they have nothing to offer but pain and heart and sorrow. When Paul got older, he said this, I am ready to spend and to be spent. Spend me, Paul saying, to buy somebody. Since you spent somebody to buy me, now spend me to buy somebody. Do you feel that way? That you're willing to be spent in order to buy someone else? That's the economy. He doesn't carry a wallet. He just carries you. And he sees someone he wants to buy. He spends your time and your effort and your prayer life in order to buy someone else. That's how he purchases. He doesn't buy you with silver or gold. He buys you with others. He buys you with people that give their lives so that you can live. Paul said, I'm ready to spend and to be spent, knowing the more I love, the less I be loved. You'll never get back in return what God spends you for, because most of you will never know what heaven will be occupied with that was bought by spending you and your time and your effort and your energy. You spent you to buy them, and you cannot add it up, and you don't have any idea what God is buying. Right? You don't have any idea what God is buying by spending you. He'll spend time you should have given to your boys. He'll spend time you should have given to your wife. There'll be times you'll spend your time here at the church when it's empty. There'll be times when you feel forsaken and nobody cares and nobody really loves. There'll be times in your life when you'll be thoroughly spent and you'll lay on your bed at night and wonder it's worth it. But one day when heaven calls and you get to walk up there, you'll get to see what God really purchased with your life. God don't spend money. He spends peace. People. And people that are willing to be spent and spent, heaven will be occupied by those. Thank you, Jesus. These are just some things that you should know.
There are a few things filled with more difficulty and perils and involvements in leadership. But there are a few things more vital and necessary. You know, we go to a restaurant to eat. It's just, you know, where two or three are gathered together, there will be food. So when we gather together to eat, everybody stands around the table like we don't know what to do. We just stand around. Where are we going to sit? Well, you moron, there's the chairs there. Just pick a seat, you know. Nobody wants to sit down. Are the men going to sit together? Are the women going to sit together? Are we going to sit across from our wives? Are the wives going to sit on one side and we sit on the other side? It doesn't matter to anybody, really. We just need a leader. We need just somebody to rise up and tell us. Like I'm an imbecile or something. I don't know. What do you do when you he was going to stand and eat, you know? Finally, somebody said, well, the men sat on this end, the women going to sit on this end. Good, that must, that's good. I don't care where we sat, just somebody tell me. And we need a leader. That's the most elementary part of our lives. We need somebody to tell us. You know, it's fraught with all kinds of destructions and hardships being a leader, you know. You can get confused. You can get upset. You can get, you, can get, you know, taken back, you know. People just need to be led. They need, they need something in their lives to lead them. More, more, no, no task is more difficult than leading people. Out of all the creation, heaven and earth obeys without question. Moon stays in this place. Sun stays in this place. Stars stay in their place. Fish stay in the sea. Birds stay in the air. Bees stay in the field. God's only problem is Adam. <laughs> without exception, all the animals get in the ark, but only eight people. The donkey is obedient and speaks the word of God only Balaam rebels because Balaam's a moron. He's got a talking donkey and he still wants a reward from the king. I'd saddle that donkey and be at the world's fairs when I do. I just, I wouldn't care about it. You got your talking donkey. You don't need no reward from nobody, you know. <laughs> Jesus has no problem putting the ear back on that Peter he cut off. But it's Peter's heart that proves the most difficult. In fact, devils, demons, diseases, storms, loaves and fishes, they all obey the Lord. Only man proves to be God's greatest challenge. Without question, people are the greatest problem. And yet they must have a leader. They must have a leader. And that's something that you should know. He doesn't care. That the, uh, it's about the house of God when they were rebuild, rebuilding the house of God. I don't know what time it is yet. Well, I'm going to move along. Let me just say this. James Petty and Bertha Petty moved up from Kentucky. All my family came to Kentucky, back, back in the woods. and back in the, They moved up there to Indianapolis, just looking for work. They rented a half double. And uh, James Petty went to work. His wife was there. They had no furniture. They didn't have no money. They didn't have anything. Just a couple of broken stuff, busted up stuff. And... Uh, they were, they were Baptists. That's, that's, I'm going to say it's a bad thing. It's just that they all were down that neck of the woods. We're all just good Baptists. I guess there is such a thing. And the uh, best they could be, you know. They didn't care if they had a pastor or not. Church right across the street, Rocky Springs Church, they didn't, half the time they didn't have a pastor. They didn't change anything, you know. They just went ahead with things like it was, like, I don't know, just went on. So... Bertha heard something coming from the other side of the half double. So women are a little inquisitive, you know, and I know you wouldn't do this, but she pulled her chair over to the wall and was listening. <laughs> she never heard anything like it. It was a woman praying. You know, can't nobody pray like a good apostolic woman. I mean, she put a man in the shade. You can get a woman on fire for God praying, man, they can touch God. They got that. I don't know what it is, you know. I don't want to pray like a woman necessarily. I just like to have the. Maybe I do need to do that. I don't know. 
she listens to that woman pray. She wasn't praying like a Baptist. You know, Baptist, well, I don't mean, I'm, I'm not trying, I'm, but they don't pray like that, you know. They kind of praying sing song, you know, now I'll lay me down to sleep. Pray the, it kind of rhymes, you know, anyway. They usually read them, read the prayer. And uh, she wasn't reading one. I mean, she was praying. And every now and then she'd talk in another language that Bertha Petty didn't understand what she was saying. But she had never heard nobody pray like that in her life. And she listened to her pray through the wall. And every day at the same time, as she knew that woman was going to pray, she drug her chair with, to the wall. And she got her ear up there and she listened to her pray. It was unbelievable. She'd never heard anything like it in her life. It was astounding. Weeks went on like that, or listened to her pray. Finally, one day, she met the woman, and the woman invited her to church, Bertha. So she went to church with her, and I'm going to cut to the chase here. She got baptized in Jesus' name, got filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. She told her husband about it, James Petty. He didn't want nothing to do with it, you know. He's a good Baptist. He didn't want nothing to do with that talking all them languages and all that mess, you know. He didn't want anything to do with it. She said, it's real. It's real. So finally she talked him into coming, and he did. He came, got baptized in Jesus' name, got filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost over a woman who prayed through a wall. And that sends me chills down my back. You get a woman who can pray through a wall? Mm. He got excited about it, and he went back down to Kentucky because he had a sister and at, at, at a niece down there, his sister's daughter, that he wanted to tell about this Holy Ghost. He went down there and told him about it. And he took him out to an old farm pond out there, probably muddy as a duck puddle, and baptized them both in Jesus' name. They got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. His niece, her name was Minnie Elizabeth. She married a man named Joe Osborne. They moved up to Indianapolis. He went in the Navy, come out of the Navy, and I was born. I never met the woman who prayed through the wall. But everything that I have in my life, everything I've ever done, little or whatever it might have been, I owe to a woman I've never met that prayed through a wall to people she had never met. And they all got the Holy Ghost. James Petty started a church in a garage on Shelby Street. He only had one white shirt, had to hock his tire at a service stage to get enough money for gas to get to church, hoping he'd get enough offering to get his tire back. His wife had washed his shirt out. They started a church. It's the church that I pastored for 45 years. And I've never met the woman who prayed through a wall. But I owe her everything, Bishop. I owe her. What if she hadn't prayed? She didn't even know anyone was listening. She didn't know there was anybody even caring about her prayer. But she prayed every day. And I owe her. Because she picked up rocks. And I've been eating corn ever since God filled me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. These are things that you should know. You may think your prayer falls on deaf ears and nobody's listening, but sometimes you have to pray through a wall and you don't know what's on the other side of it. You don't know. When I get to heaven, after I spend some time with Jesus, I want to meet the woman. I want to shake her hand and say, thank you for the days you prayed and you didn't think anybody was listening. Somebody on the other side of the wall had their ear up there and they listened to somebody pray like they'd never heard in their whole lives. This is something you should know, that your prayers, you can't qualify them. You pray, and you don't know whether they accomplished anything or not. But heaven is going to reveal everything that happened because you picked up some rocks to give the next generation some hope that they could eat corn out of your labor and your struggles and your hardships. Stand with me. Lift your hands and love the Lord for people who have prayed through walls. 
We don't know how you got here. You have no idea why God chose you out of the world. You have no idea of the prayers that were prayed for you by a mother, by a father, by a sister or a brother. You have no idea of pastors that have stood in the gap for your life and prayed prayers over you. You thought you just changed your mind. You didn't just change your mind. Somebody prayed through the wall that you had built up. You had built up a wall between you and God, but there was somebody that got down on their knees and prayed through that wall and allowed your life to be changed and reorganized in your life. I want you to praise him for a few minutes, if you would, please. Would you praise him for a few minutes? I praise you, dear God, for how you brought me out of the miry clay. I thank you, dear God, that everything I've done was done to a generation that got here before me, and I've just entered into their labors. I'm reaping what they sowed. I'm blessed because somebody prayed through a wall. I'm blessed because someone didn't give up. Someone didn't surrender. Someone stayed in the gap. You young people ought to learn to love him. Because you didn't get here by yourself either. You could be on drugs. You could be anywhere, but you've had a pastor and will have a pastor and a bishop that prayed for your life and you didn't even know your prayers were being heard. You didn't know that somebody had prayed through a wall to get to you because you'd built up resistance against God. You'd built up this fortification against God and now God has got a man to pray through the wall for your life. Beg God not to kill you. Beg God. You know, all you know is the seventh chapter of the book of Acts. You don't know there's an eighth, there's a ninth, there's a tenth. There's a Romans, there's a Colossians, there's an Ephesians. You don't know. You don't know. But someday Stephen will know that God spent Stephen to buy Paul. You lay on your bed at night. I just want you to remember. That if God is spending, he's buying. You just may never know what he bought. But when you get to heaven and you need to do your best to make it, that's where your reward's going to be. This is what you bought when you didn't think you bought anything. What a lovely, lovely Lord, willing to be spent. I'm willing to spend, Paul said, and be spent, knowing the more I love, the less I love back. You never get back in love, except from God, who will love you. For willingness for him to spend you to buy somebody else. Thank you, Jesus. Bishop. Thank you, Thank you sir. Pastor Ryan, would you and Sherry and your boys come up here? I think maybe my wife took Georgia out. Y'all will come stand up here at the front. Pastor and Sister Brandon, would y'all come? Pastor McCool, I want you and Sister McCool to come. Pastor Derek, would you and would you and Alicia come and help us pray? Chris and Sarah, would y'all come? Anybody that wants to gather around, come. Come and get in close. We're fixing to pray. Thank you, Brother Osborne. What we just heard, we will not forget. That message got us past the parking lot today. 
Amen. Brother Osborne, I want you to lay hands on this couple. Would you lay hands on them? Brother McCool, you and your wife, I want you to lay hands on them. And this entire congregation is going to pray right now. Father, we just ask you to allow this couple to serve their generation. Pray, church, pray. Pray. Every guest here, pray. All the people of God, pray. That's all we ask is you would help us serve this generation. To remember what was said here today. To carry it on. To carry on this great truth. This message that transforms lives forever. Raise up another generation, oh God, of men and women who can be spent, who are willing to be spent. We believe in what we're doing here today. We believe we'll never be the same. God, we're looking. We're going to serve this generation. We're not going to live in the past. Too many, too many people who need God for us to live in the past. Too many lives that need to be transformed to live in the past. Thank you for what you've done. We'll never forget it. But there's better days ahead because the kingdom of God only knows interest. And of the increase of his kingdom, there will be no end. Your kingdom knows only increase, God. There's no end to the
of elders here that stood with me and my wife, that worked with us, that gave their time, their treasure, their talents. And I know there's another generation that's gonna give the same thing to our new leaders at the Pentecostals of Bossier. We're not looking back. We're moving on. Can I get a witness from somebody right now? I know our service was a little longer. I don't care. It was worth every second. This is a unique day. We got barbecue in the back. Give the Lord one more hand clap and shout with a voice of triumph. 